Hey, everyone. Welcome to Locked on Lakers for Thursday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. Andy, they say it cannot be done. The Lakers can't beat the Denver Nuggets. We say, yes, they can, and we'll give you some reasons why. Next. You are Locked on Lakers, your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks to everybody for making Locked On Lakers first listen of every day, Monday through Friday, and obviously, especially during the playoffs on weekends. No matter how or where you get your podcasts, this one's always free. It's never going to be behind a paywall. And Locked On Lakers on YouTube, Andy, is where over 23,000, 53 53 if they win this series, 23,000 subscribers are all trying to figure out exactly how the Lakers can solve the riddle that has been the Denver Nuggets. Um and look, I mean, I, I saw today uh, that no team uh, in their, their first round, projected first round, is more heavily favored in the Western Conference to win their matchup than the Nuggets over the Lakers. Um, I've seen nobody who suggests the Lakers can win this series. I saw any people suggesting the Lakers should risk missing the playoffs entirely just to avoid playing in this in this series. Um, what up, Harrison? What up, Anthony? <laughs> So, and it wasn't just them, although Harrison really, I mean, God bless him, leaned into it hard. Good for him. Nobody really get, goes full bloom in the playoffs like our friend Harrison Fagan. It is always a joy to watch um, him perform during the playoffs on the internet. I will say this. I, I don't know if I would pick the Lakers, but I am uh, very much past the like look you know it's not i don't think it's gonna be a sweep and i'm telling you if i keep on the path that i'm on by saturday i'm gonna be like it's not gonna be a sweep because i'm sure denver will win a game or two like you know, <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna i mean I, i'm not gonna disrespect the defending champions so much that i won't say they're gonna win a game um but like i'm starting to i'm starting to convince myself andy um let, let's get this as the baseline because i do have a list of things that i actually do think Help the Lakers versus the Nuggets versus in other years. Where As do I. You? As yeah. do I. It's an it's an episode of optimism for Lakers fans. It is not doom and gloom. Where do you kind of stand right now? Um, pre list before we start talking ourselves into this. Um, just generally, like where do you feel about the Lakers versus the Nuggets at this very moment? We'll get into some of our specific reasons in terms of why we think this series could be better than last year. But broadly speaking, without getting Pollyanna, because the reasons to worry about the Lakers in this series are both well-documented and, frankly, self-evident. The Lakers lost all three games they've played against Denver. They lost seven straight going back to the playoffs, maybe eight or nine straight counting Parts of last year, though, I think they played all three of those games before last year's trade deadline. So to some degree, I don't even count those. But, you know, seven straight losses is is enough. <laughs> I don't necessarily need nine or Do ten to, to be go back to the aughts. I don't think so. <laughs> but that, that being said, though, I do actually think the Lakers are better situated for this year's go-around with Denver than last year's go-around with Denver – because I think this team is better than the one that squared off against Denver last year for a variety of different reasons that we're going to end up talking about. But all in all, I just think they are a better team in a better overall place. Obviously, this is not – if you are trying to go as far as you can and you're trying to plan the, the perfect route, going up against Denver in the first round isn't the way most people would go. I, mm -hmm. I I think you'd be lying to yourself to say it's ideal, but if this is the way it's going to shake out and they were going to end up most likely playing Denver at some point, I do actually think the Lakers are just in a better place this year than they were last year to try to make something of this. And I will say, if you're, you know, short of, I mean, the, the biggest reason, you know, and I, I, I had this back and forth with a bunch of people, both on Twitter at Cam Brothers, uh, on the YouTube page and all that, like, oh, let's just get him over. Like, if you could just like, get, let's just get it over with now. It's like, no, you, you know, in a perfect world, you delay this as long as possible. Weird things happen. You don't root for injuries, but injuries happen. The Lakers, 
I think in part didn't get a chance to repeat because Anthony Davis got hurt against the Phoenix Suns. I think he doesn't do that. I think the Lakers win that series. And we talk about this, this uh, LeBron AD era in very different ways because I think they would have at the very least gotten back to the finals. Um, at the very least, they don't trade for Russ. Oh, you're right. <laughs> of that. I mean, if they go a couple rounds, I'm guessing they don't make right. that Coming- dramatic. Coming next week, or two weeks, or three weeks from now, we go, at some point we're now going to go back in the time capsule for that one. But I, I, I will say this: like it is, you mean injury? You know, stuff happens. You want to put this off as long as possible. But if just straight up, assuming both teams are healthy, assuming both teams have their full complement of players, and Jamal Murray is is back, and you know, after another week off, should be not like fixing on the like you know maybe jamal murray's not right i just assume jamal murray's fine um if you're going to play as the lakers you 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 are most likely to beat denver early rather than late because our stars the lakers um you know the the lebron james anthony davis quite frankly, are more likely to get banged up and beat up and whatever in ways that make them less effective than I think Nikola Jokic and even Jamal Murray and ever because they've also got Aaron Gordon and Michael Porter Jr. and, you know, Kentavious Caldwell Pope and so on and so on and so on and so on. So I think the degradation that happens in the playoffs naturally hurts the Lakers more than it hurts the, the Nuggets. So I think early is better. You also have more in the playoffs early where you get two days off between games. That happens a couple times back and forth, whereas later it's every other day and that's just how it is. So I think that. The biggest thing, though, that I think is really important to understand is that when you say seven straight, when you talk about a sweep last year, it conjures images of one team dominating another. And no doubt, the Nuggets have been better than the Lakers in these games. But it's misleading because if you look at those seven games, go back to the playoffs last year, um, game one, three-point game, two minutes left. Game two, two-point game, one minute left. Game three, not super close down the stretch, still tied with eight minutes to go. So it's not like the Lakers were down 30 at, you know, in this game or whatever. Game point, game four was a two-point game at the finish. The game was, you know, they, Denver won by two. Um you go to the games that were played this season. The first one, which I think is the least important because it was you know October 24th, the Lakers had a completely different starting lineup. It was ring night. It was all this other thing. And it was, again, October 24th. I don't think there's anything game that happened that long. The Lakers had won. I would say it doesn't matter. That, was the, the, that one wasn't particularly close down the stretch. The second game, one-point game, under four minutes to play. Tie game with two minutes left in, in the third one. So it's like the Lakers are there in all of these games. What they have to solve is what you know I described in yesterday's show as a last mile problem. The Lakers don't get dominated for 48 minutes by the by the the Nuggets. They get dominated for four. It's just an important four because they're the ones at the end. Yeah. I'm not saying it. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm not saying all yeah. of this doesn't matter. I'm just saying it is a misleading thing to say seven uh, seven straight. They don't have a chance. It's like, no, these have been pretty close games. If the Lakers can solve that riddle of the last three or four minutes and just break through in one of these games, Andy, I think they're not that far apart. Well, here's the way I would put it. Um, First of all, when you mentioned that fourth quarter and that crunch time, in these seven games that we're talking about, who won the first quarter, who won the second quarter, who won the third quarter varies. But five of the seven, Denver won the fourth quarters. Mm -hmm. That feels very indicative of what you're talking about. Close can be in the eye of the beholder and, you know, how you frame a close game, whatever, but they were definitely competitive. All seven of these games were at the very least competitive games because some people might say you got to be within six to be close, eight to be close, two to be close. Like I said, in five of the seven, they were within three with like three minutes left. I mean, like, there is no definition under which that is not a close game. Sure, but they've all been competitive regardless of mm-hmm. the final score. Like, they don't seem outclassed 
versus Denver in the same way that, quite frankly, the Lakers have seemed outclassed by the Kings. <laughs> like, there's certain ways. They've gotten their asses kicked by the Kings. <laughs> yes, which was yet, which was one of the many reasons why the suggestion of, let's just roll the dice on a potential single elimination game right. against Sacramento was, right. but by the way, a madness. Is and what you've it was. seen... Zion leave a game that you know that you know theoretically you don't want to have to play like they tried to win that game on Sunday so they wouldn't have to play on Tuesday. Oh, by the way, Zion gets hurt. You see Jimmy Butler limp out of the arena in the MCL Eastern injury Conference. reportedly. Yeah, you know, and just like playing these games. Like, oh, let's just throw in an extra game with Anthony Davis, who struggled to get through Tuesday's game. And all they said, hold your thought though with with talking about close versus not the fourth quarters and all this. We're also going to talk about Anthony Davis and Nikola Jokic because and my we, list. And my yeah, list. and your list of, of optimistic reasons. Because this AD Jokic thing, I think people are thinking of it, and Andy, you've dug up some really interesting numbers in the wrong way. So we'll get to all of these things next. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by Monopoly Go, and in the right setting, I can be really competitive. I get super competitive, for example, when I play poker. I can get weirdly competitive when I do something that, it, in the grand scheme of things, is pretty insignificant, like playing pickleball with friends. I check the rankings of this podcast against others in the field. We do very nicely, by the way. And my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. That's actually more than Locked On Lakers, but still, we do well. It's By a eight. great. It is, it is eight more downloads than Locked <laughs> yes, On Lakers. Exactly. Just eight, but still, eight. I'm competitive. So right. those eight matter to me. It's <laughs> a great to twist. Monopoly Go. <laughs> it's a great twist on Monopoly, where you play not one but a hundred, hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. And you get to mess with your friends. Like if you play with them, you can charge them rent on the iconic properties, rob their vaults of riches for yourself, like a reverse Robin Hood, and the leaderboards show who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. I think, you know, you, you basically understand what I'm getting at with the, this idea of... of the Lakers being more competitive in these games than I think they're being given credit for. Um, and the Lakers are going to be a little healthier in this series than they were. LeBron has already said, like I limped through the playoffs in a big way last year. He is going to be fine. And, you know, and Anthony Davis, I'm assuming by Saturday will be okay. Um, this is as healthy as the Lakers are going to get. Jared Vanderbilt, I guess, is not a thing anymore. Um, but Gabe Vincent, kind of back. Like, you know, seems like he maybe he found a little bit of a groove here. So, like, the Lakers, this is probably as good as they're going to be. So, in that sense, yeah, got a better chance to play Denver now than, than down the road. Uh, that is just one half, though, Andy, of the reasons we've got on Optimism Thursday to be optimistic about the Lakers for the Nuggets. I've, I've deemed this optimism Thursday uh, for the Lakers to be, you know, Lakers fans to feel maybe more confident than they otherwise would have. Uh, you have your own list. Yeah. Um, first of all, D'Angelo Russell and Rui Hachimura are both having career best seasons. Like Rui per 36. I just looked up his numbers. He's averaging 18 points and six rebounds on nearly 54% from the field, 42% from behind the arc, like those are really, for a guy that's basically like your fourth or fifth option, that's pretty damn good. And D'Angelo Russell having a career best season, I think really matters when you take into account the narrative about D'Angelo Russell in the playoffs, which is not entirely undeserved, but also in particular, this series against Denver, where that reputation just got completely you know, magnified even more. You, you talked about AD hopefully being healthy by Saturday. This version of Anthony Davis this year is better than the version last year. Last year, they did not have a playable, true backup big. Jackson Hayes is that guy now. So if you need somebody with that sort of size, either coming off the bench behind AD or even playing with AD, that is now an option that did not exist last year. Last year's team could not make threes or space the floor 
to save its life. They shot under 35% as a team from behind the arc. This year's team ended the year as one of the best in the league at just under 38% and was top three in the league after the All-Star break at 39. D'Angelo Russell, 41 and a half on about seven-ish per game. Rui Hachimura, like I said, 42%. LeBron, 41 on good volume. Torian Prince, just under 40% on good volume. Austin Reeves is at around 37%, which is good. Dinwiddie solid. And like last year, Austin was really expected to be one of the guys carrying the team from distance, especially if D'Lo had a slump. And some of the guys that were expected to space the floor, whether you're talking about Malik Beasley, Troy Brown, Lonnie Walker, up and down, they weren't capable or deemed capable of being on the floor. You include Max Christie in that equation, or like even Mo Bamba, who was brought in to space the floor, he wasn't available for basically all of the playoffs. They also, too, in the series against Denver, got off to a just horrific start in game one because Darvin Ham inexplicably decided to go small with the starting lineup against the big Denver. And not that Darvin can't make mistakes this year. He's not going to make that one again, though, is he? Right. That's my point, though. There is a 0% chance that they will open with the wrong lineup. But And I think that really matters because this year's starting five, in my opinion, is better than last year's starting five. And there's no ambiguity or debate with it. Your five best players are the ones in the starting five. So none of this is to say that I think the Lakers are definitely going to pull an upset. Like if you are looking to lay odds on this, I hate to say it, the smart, safer money is on Denver. But I genuinely feel the Lakers are in a far better place this year to take on this series than they were last year. They are and should be, you know, I mentioned the the odds and, you know, the, the, they should be underdogs in this series. But I actually even yeah. think that helps them a little bit because, you know, Anthony Davis goes and acquits himself well, you know, that's great. LeBron has had... I want to say quietly has had like a, a fantastic second half, like elite level um, second half, at least, you know, on, on, on the offensive side of the ball. Um, but, but those guys actually been pretty cranked up too. He's cranked up, but that's what you sort of expected. Like, you know, there's those two guys have played very well. The Lakers have a lot of question marks in front of them. And we will have, we have a lot of time to talk about these things, no matter how far the Lakers go in the playoffs. You know, you hope for a bounce back from from D'Lo and all that kind of stuff. But like, you know, Anthony Davis, it's not like LeBron James and Anthony Davis are going to be back next year, barring something very odd that has really, I don't think, anything to do with what we see in this first round series. Those guys are coming back. Like they might move other guys around, um, but it's not like this is... the In the end of the Golden State game, Andy, for example, like, you know, the Warriors losing feels like the end of something like the way they lost as a 10 seed like just feels like the end of something well, especially this, because with with the really quick with the warriors it's felt like the end was happening like three different times right before what we just saw against sacramento the the lakers don't have that they they've got there's always pressure and there's always chatter and there's always that but the lakers are going to be an anthony davis lebron james crew next year. Austin Reeves will likely be back unless they make some sort of superstar trade. Rui Hachimura, same kind of thing. Like a lot of the principles will probably return. There's not a ton of that kind of pressure on them in this series. Everyone is going to pick them to lose. Mm -hmm. Most people are going to pick them to lose Either in five, some people might say six, there will probably be a f more nuggets in four than you would expect given LeBron James is on the other team. I, um, I, you I know, said like, so, I'm just like there is zero pressure by Lakers standards on this. In fact, some fans might be rooting for them to get their asses kicked because it might mean Darvin gets fired faster. <laughs> So yeah, like even fans won't be that mad if they lose yeah. early. That that is a uh, 
common school of thought that I've heard from a lot of media, certainly seen from a lot of Laker fans. You know, it's interesting you were saying like the way Denver is going to be predominantly picked. Like if you started looking at, say, predictions from ESPN, from The Athletic, Fox Sports and the like, I bet you will see more Denver in four than Denver in six. If you can win, like, I almost feel like this is either a seven game series or a four game series. You understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I feel like I feel like if the Lakers can't kind of break through relatively quickly, that they actually could lose. You know, that, I mean, that game four, for example, last year, obviously, it was a very close game, and that was the one where LeBron didn't leave the floor for, I guess, technically <laughs> like 19 seconds or something like that and tried to will them to a win, and it was still short. And, they, and again, it's the fourth game of a sweep. Um, you know, I could see something like that happening if the Lakers get the doors blown off on in game one, um, can't break through in game two. Now you're talking about, you know, for, but if they can split in Denver, I actually think this deal. is a long series. I just, you know, the playoffs are a strange place, and the Lakers are not a typical you know, bottom half of the bracket seat. And this is one of the best teams in the Western Conference over the second half of the season. But if they're going to do something unexpected in this series, there is one big thing that needs to change, Andy, and you've got it broken down. We'll get to it next. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by FanDuel. It is Playoff time in the NBA, in the NHL, baseball is in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets. Guaranteed, that's 150 bucks. Win or lose, go nuts. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right. So I feel like most people now, if they were at like Denver in five, are probably feeling Denver in six or maybe Denver in seven. Um, let's see if we can get them <laughs> maybe the Lakers in seven, Lakers in six, Lakers in five. Um there, there is one thing that needs to change, a significant thing that needs to change for the Lakers to have a chance in this series. Yeah. I mean, drilling stuff down to AD versus Jokic can sometimes feel super myopic and even stupid just because the conversation around Anthony Davis specifically often gets super myopic and stupid. But the difference in production between him and Jokic, it's pretty stark. Over the three regular season games, Jokic's splits against the Lakers, 29 points, 12 rebounds, nine assists on 55% from the field, 37 and a half from behind the arc. He did average just 3.3 field uh, free throw attempts per game, which is below his averages, but it's still very dominant and overall well above his season averages. So Jokic has even by Jokic standards, killed it against the Lakers. AD, three regular season splits. 22 points, nine rebounds, three assists on 47% from the field. Um, he's done okay getting himself to the line, about average for the year. Three blocks, which is obviously good. And it's not even that those numbers are terrible, but they're not great either, and they are below his averages. And then if you look at the four playoff games from last year, Jokic averaged, I mean, these are insane. Jokic averaged a 28.14 and a half rebound, 12 assist, triple double on 51% shooting, 47% from behind the arc. I'm new AD, to the sport. That's good. <laughs> That's considered yeah. good. AD, now just to be clear, averaged 27 points, 14 rebounds, two assists, three blocks per game. 49% from the field. And it's closer to what Jokic was doing compared to AD in the regular season this year, which I think in part explains the series being, like we talked about before, competitive. And honestly, when you look back at the stuff that happened 
in that series last year that were problems for the Lakers. I actually rank Anthony Davis just in a vacuum, relatively low on the list, like just in terms of him himself. But it doesn't change the fact that everything has been so decidedly in Jokic's favor. Mm -hmm. And look, AD cannot shut down Jokic because nobody can shut down Jokic. And if we're being honest, Jokic is a better player than Anthony Davis. Sure. But AD has to level it out more. Like he can't get outplayed as starkly. Like if, if he can play these things too close to a draw, just close to a draw, maybe like one game in the series where he definitively outplays Jokic, that will make a massive difference in the series. It does. I think particularly, like, I think you're framing it right because it's it's not the Lakers need, you know, he's got to be better than the Lakers because like that is, some of that is predicated on like what can the Lakers as a group do with Anthony with uh, Jokic? And the answer is probably collectively not a lot because there's a reason that he's going to keep piling up MVPs in any season where the league, where media just isn't kind of bored with the idea of giving it to him because his numbers are insane and they're every year they look like this. Um, but it's the gap. And at the very least, what you can't have are stats like this year. I mean, he was, and Davis was pretty good in that series. It's like, it's, you know, you go back and you don't want to pin, you know, kind of pin that on him, but in the games this season, like you can't be below your season averages against the nuggets and for the Lakers to have a chance to win. Like he's got to be at or above what you look at and say, that's a good Anthony Davis game. You need four of those and three. Wow. Um, you know, above and beyond. And if you get that, you know, again, we're, you know, we're, we're talking here. I'm not saying they're going to win, but like the Lakers, some stuff's going to have to break their way. You're going to need sustained levels of, consistency from d that put him on the same levels. I mean, you got to figure out how to deal with Michael Porter Jr. and Aaron Gordon, which defensively is just a nightmare. Look, for like Jamal Murray's splits against the Lakers. Holy jeebus, man. They are insane. They are, but last like, year in, in the part, playoffs. Though, all I'm saying is in part they're insane because of the challenge of trying to figure like it's Michael Porter Jr. is 6'10. It is easy to forget how big he is. And like you can't mm -hmm. just I think people think of him as a three-point shooter, he's a scorer. We're like you put a guard on him and call it a day. Like he's 6'10. You know, Aaron Gordon is a he's shorter than that, but might as well be 11 feet tall because he can jump through the roof. Like these guys present unique matchup problems that unlock someone like Jamal Murray in ways that if they weren't there, Murray wouldn't be as effective. And Murray is, he is a big game killer. Like that, I mean, that's just been proven out by now. He may, because of health and whatever, may never make an all-star team. He's been around a long time without ever making it, but that guy scares the crap out of people in the playoffs rightly. Like his numbers, I was looking him up last year, 25 points, in the playoffs last year, I'm sorry, 32 points, six rebounds, five assists, nearly three steals on 53% from the field, almost 41% from behind the arc. Like that's nuts. And this year he's averaging 25, five and nine on 51, 47 splits. Like he's a problem, man. Jamal Murray is a problem and Murray and Jokic play as well off each other as any duo in the nba like they're just incredible together yeah i i i i admit i i, I love watching the nuggets play like i don't have a ton of extra time to just sit around and watch you know rando teams play um, i mean i try we both try to keep up on western conference teams but we've got kids we've got jobs we've got you know like got, there, there are limitations when i get the chance to watch extra basketball I seek out the Nuggets because I just yeah. I love watching Jokic. I love watching Murray. I think, you know, I, I got fond memories of Contavious Caldwell Pope. Good dude for him to succeed. And I enjoy 
maybe it's because I don't cover it every day. Maybe it's more frustrating if you do. It. I, I enjoy the Mike Malone experience. Like I find, you know, him to be delightfully red tushed. And um, I understand why his players like him so much. Oh, he's unintentionally hilarious. Yeah, absolutely. And so like, you know, it's just like, it's just, it's a well-run organization. I like their uniforms. So it's just, it's, it's in Denver's a great city. So I, you know, they, they're all, they're sort of that team that, well, if the Lakers can't win it, that's a team that I really like to watch play because they sort of do it in a way that I hate the term respects the game, but like, it's just, it's, it's a fun way to play basketball with good players who do cool things. And, um, Anyway, but so like this is a tall order, but I don't, I just don't think it's impossible. I, I think this idea that Lakers cannot possibly win this series is not true. Like, I think they have a, I would even say better than a puncher's chance. I think they've got a 20% chance, 25% okay. chance, something like that. Okay. Sure. That's not overwhelming but it's not nothing we'll get we got some st great stuff lined up to get everybody ready for this series jason tim is going to join us he is the host of uh hoops tonight at volume sports so you know just a great basketball uh intellect knows the game backwards and forwards played uh, the game know, played the game i know a lot of people follow him on twitter and and stuff like that and his social feeds and and all that stuff he's going to join us for friday's show uh, working on the crossover with the 743 people who host Locked on Nuggets to get ready for that series. Always fun when we get a chance to talk to those dudes. So we're going to get everybody ready. We're feeling optimistic. We are not going to be Debbie Downers. Um, we're not going to we're not going to blow smoke, you know, where it shouldn't be blown. But we're I really I believe what I'm saying. Um, and so. We're doing this. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Get you ready for game one on Saturday. See everyone then.